we had uh, actually with somebody I spoke this morning, he says, you know what? I do pineapple pizza. Not only do a pineapple pizza. I, I roast the pineapple with poblano peppers and I do this and then I put it on. A, no, it's still pineapple on the pizza. I don't care what you dress it up. It's still pineapple on the pizza. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Center for Victory's podcast of your best day yet. At Center for Victory, we're here to help unlock, reinforce, and enrich relationships through personal professional development. I'm Eric Guy, Chief Victory Officer at the Center for Victory. Today with me is a uh, what's becoming a friendship. Um, uh, this gentleman that uh, is going to be talking to you folks today reached out to me. Um, and I accepted the invitation. I was like, I don't know what it is about him. And we started talking and it's been great so far. And I can't uh, wait to see what's going to happen. He's got a lot of energy. I absolutely love what he's doing. Um, uh, Mr. Christian Fisher, uh, he's the, he, he leads, he does so many things guys. Like he's, <laughs> he's, he's moving and shaking, uh, culinary leadership Academy, the disruptive chef entrepreneur podcast, which is great. And uh, the Culinary Executive Mastermind. Christian, welcome to the show, sir. Um, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I just, it, how did this all get started for you? Because I think, <laughs> you know, it, you, and, and for those of you that are in the restaurant business, I want you to pay attention. Okay. Because what he has going on is very similar to some of the other things we have been involved with especially like in the construction industry and, and things of that nature um but where did all this get started christian uh, it's a really good question so um and uh, i try to make it brief but for me you know i grew up in the uh restaurant industry my parents owned the hotel for you know 60 plus years back home in austria and i have five brothers five sisters and I'm the only one left in the food industry. So that should give you an indication where that, that is heading. Um, my dad, you know, was really the guy behind it, uh, doing everything and he took a toll on his life. And for me, he was upset that I didn't take over the restaurant. So I said, I need to start my own out the hotel. I started my own restaurant, started my restaurant at 19. I had uh, six by the time I was 23. And then a company came and said, Hey, we want to buy your restaurant concept. And I was 23 years old. I didn't know idea what that meant. And so <laughs> this company buys my restaurant concept and brings it to the US. I made it the hotel concept for Stouffer Hotel. And they offered me a job for 20 years. I worked with them for 18. And then after that, um, they wanted me to move back to Europe. And at the time, I had already some of my children. And, and you know, all my children are international adopted children. And I said, I can't go. So I went to one of my, at the time, clients and said, hey, I need to find a job. Do you know anybody? He says, yeah, you should work for me. I uh, worked with them for 18 years. I uh, was the chief culinary officer, officer for them. I managed um, just a little bit over a thousand locations and uh, six billion in food and beverage. And wow. um, I loved what I did. And I didn't like who I did it for. And subconsciously I always had side hustles, you know, gas stations, little market, coffee shops. We have three restaurants now. Um, I had franchise, magazine franchises, that kind of stuff. So we always had something going on. COVID happened and I realized I love what I did. I didn't like who I did it for. And I used COVID as the tool for me to get out. Uh, I had at the time a two-year non-compete. So I went to them and said, hey, how about if I walk away, you don't give me any money and I don't owe you any time. And they agreed to it. So I walked away a free man. Um, but for me, I had a really good friend who was then my business partner, Joe. And so he called me and he said, Christian, what are we going to do for the industry? Our industry is not great to begin with. We need to find a way to support. I says, what do you have in mind? He says, we should do that Zoom thing, you know, where we should go on Zoom and we should do East Coast, West Coast, because he's in California at the time. Um, and we do just call me, just hang out. I and mean, people have problems, they should call in, you know? Yeah. It's like, you and I don't know anything about that. What are we going to do? He says, how oh, we just help him with food stuff? So Joe was really the driver behind that. So we had office hours. Tuesday was West Coast. Thursday was, was East Coast. And some days we just sat there talking like you and I did for six, eight hours. And then people came in for 20 minutes. Some hung out for three hours. And we found that what they really needed was support. I mean, they needed somebody that they felt like they were hurt and being part of them, we gave them tasks because so they, they started, um, you know, to 
be, be needed. And that started what then eventually became the Culinary Executive Mastermind, which we currently rebranding because we had all these chefs on, you know, and for the last few years, but now we have more non-chefs. Now it's the business disrupt the mastermind because we have more non-culinary, but that started all of that. And for me, you know, we are, what is maybe interesting for your audience, uh, back in 2009, I always was very interested. How come this guy does so much better than this guy in a the restaurant? They're in the same town. They have the same price point. They went to the same culinary school. How come one of them succeeds and the other one doesn't? And for me, there was always, I always wanted to know why, why do people do what they do? And one of my friends, I knew there was something going on with him. He never shared. And one day, you know, I found him in a walk-in. And so he left a young family. And for me, it was like, this is just not right. We need to find a way to support that. So and that's where when started you said out. you found him, he had hung yeah. himself. He hung himself in a walk-in. Yeah. Yeah. And um, left a young family. I didn't know what to do. All I knew is how to make food. So I went together with uh, four of my friends and we created chefs for a cause where we went out. We did free events every weekend and the money we made, we gave back to his family. We uh, were able to come up with just about $180,000 for the first six months, which is not justifying to do what, what, he did and it, it, it helped, but you know, there was more to it. So, but we was like, Hey, maybe we need to do more. And as we started peeling back, why, what was going on is I think what is, and you know that, and people listening to it, if you are an entrepreneur and if you're a good entrepreneur, it's a very lonely job. Mm -hmm. And for me, what I found all chefs are highly creative people. They need a way of of not just interacting, they need people like them in order to keep them motivated. And with him, the problem, what seemed to be the cause of that was not as big as it maybe was for him at the time. And so we, we said, hey, we need to help chefs. And for me, I'm a big leadership guy. I said, hey, this is not just leadership. I love John Maxwell. And I love what he says that everything rises and falls around leadership. Yes. I want to step further. I want to say everything rises and falls around self-leadership. Because if I can't manage me, my emotions, my team, how am I going to manage a business? And we started our first program, which was a free program. We still give away for free at the Culinary Leadership Academy, which is our leadership program. It's a 30-day self-evaluation program. And I know that's a long answer, but that's how it started. Yeah. And, you know, going back to what you said, Christian, I mean, it, you know, we see a lot of this. I was just talking to a gentleman yesterday about this, the rate of, of substance abuse, drug abuse, divorce, suicides in the construction industry. Uh, you're seeing the same thing in restaurants and I've seen the yeah. same thing, but you've it, really been in it. You've had that story. That was a friend. Um can you give us some of those stats so people can kind of get their head wrapped around yeah, it? Yeah, so, you know, there's a few different organizations we uh, associate with, and the latest numbers we got was from 22. And in the U.S., there's about 3.2 million, they call them chefs, anybody who has somebody report to them, so as somebody who is re responsible. And out of the 3.2 million in the U.S., um, we had over 350,000 check themselves into a substance abuse program. And I think that number might be even higher because there's still people which don't think they have a problem. And then they saying, if somebody's just checked themselves and being burned out, they didn't even qualify that, you know? The second thing was we had 130 plus thousand got divorced. And also in 2017, we had 1,017 suicides. And the challenge with all of that is you know, with, with the restaurant industry, alcohol is everywhere, drug everywhere in the, in the hospitality industry, and it's a high pressure job. Uh, and most of those chefs work 60, 80, 100 hours. You need to find a way to have an outlet for that because alcohol is not it. And you probably know this better than anybody. If you keep this bottle, then the numbers rack up. And in 2017, is a lot. 1017 is maybe 1017 too many because I I also realized that our industry is very much like the military. You know, you don't show any emotions, you don't ask questions, you don't ask for help, you don't show anything. We just get it done. If it's not working, you just need to work harder. 
And for me, I started looking out for that. I says, who of my friends is spending more time at work than at home? Because that's for me an indication that something is wrong. And then also when they started not cutting back on hours or, you know, from their kitchen staff and they picked up extra shifts. For me, there was a problem with that. And for me, I come in, I said, hey, what's going on? Why is this guy not working here? Oh, I just, you know, I want to save some money. No, 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 that's better way of saving money. Because if, if you do the job, how are you going to be able to fix anything? And so it became, we created these programs for chefs to, you know, if there's a food cost, let's find what the food cost problem is. And then, you know, I'm, I'm a, a server by nature. I was like, how can I make it easier for them? And we created what is known as a food service GPO, uh, which is a group purchasing organization. So I went out there, I renegotiated deals with 400 plus manufacturers and I passed these savings on. The average GPO works on 17 plus more percentage profit. I work on three quarters of a percent. So for me, it was more to help and I just start, I, I, I charge an administration fee um, because I want to have the little guy have the same unfair advantages as the bigger companies. We don't do contracts. We don't do any of that. If we screw up and you don't like us, you know, I walk away and sorry, um, we screwed up. But for me, I created all these programs for chefs and said, hey, how can I deliver even more and help them so this doesn't happen again? And, you know, we built 16 businesses around that yet. Um, and we now officially international. And that's, <laughs> that's what we do. Yeah. And you're bringing these folks into these, to the executive masterminds. Uh, Christian, you know, explain what you're doing with them. How, you know, what are you, what are you helping them with? What help do they like, do they get? What's, what's the feedback been? Um, so that's a really good question. So for me, um, my wife always said, if I wouldn't be a chef, I would be a researcher because as we looked and uh, you know, the story, you came to my podcast as we reached out to you, and by the way, thanks for accepting that called reach. I didn't want to do a podcast with you until I know everything I can find out about you. So I spent two, three weeks, kind of, I guess, I, I, I felt Clay was stalking you. I was like, oh, I like the way he said that. Ooh, my people would love that. And then you know, it just kind of became this thing with like, we really need to bring him on. So for me, I research. And for me, if, if you're honestly asking me what we do, I we do an intake with uh, the people which want to come. It's not join. We want to make sure you're fit. Um, we have these questions we're asking, we do ask you to do this, give us that, to kind of give us a profile of who you really are. And then when you come on to our group, um, you know, meetings, and we do them virtually, we do uh, still East Coast and West Coast, we do two a month. Um, and then we had one last night. And so if I have Greg come on and had Mercedes on, and there was um, a Peter, I'm sitting there and I say, hey, Peter, what are you working on? And we have what we call a hot seat. Oh, I do this, this, and this, and this. And I said, oh, Mercedes, because now I know people. I said, Mercedes, what do you think? How should he manage that? She said, well, he should call me. I do it for him half the time for half the cost. Don't even bother, you know? And so what do this for us? We connect people within those mastermind calls. And then we bring speakers in. We just had uh, Chris Cummins in. Uh, if you haven't heard of Chris Cummins, you need to have him. Uh, seven, soon to be eight-time TEDx talk master. He's absolutely amazing. His message is so good, and he's so good in breaking it down. So he gave us a 20-minute speech, and then for an hour and a half, he said, hey, what business are you in? And this is, oh, I'm a restaurant. Okay, tell me about your restaurant. Okay, what makes you happy? So he kind of breaks it down. He says, you're not in the restaurant business. You are an architect of memories. And you should see that person's face. I was like, never really thought about it. That's me. That's me. And he's so good about that. So he was one of our guest speakers. And so for us, we, we do three meetings on our own, guest speaker, three people on our three meetings on our own. So we want to provide value where they come together, learn, share, and be vulnerable. Not vulnerable that we, you know, tell them about that. Because he's just saying, I'm really struggling with that. I don't know. I've been trying so hard. I can't break through. Does anybody have a solution for us? And, you know, most of the time people do. Mm -hmm. And through this, we, this year alone, started 19 business from our members. We have 36 members in our group. Um, they started businesses together. There's partnerships they're doing together. They, uh, just before this, I was on uh, with two of my members. One of them said, hey, we're starting our own version of what you're doing, but we want to make it a membership site because we want to teach them this. And somebody said, hey, 
there's this restaurant down the street. Tom, do you want to be my chef? I make a 50-50 partner. And, and for me, it became this group more of, of you know, people building relationships and businesses together because they trust each other, because we we trying to provide a, a, a safe um, space for them. And for us, that's really what we do. We, we want to help you with what you're asking for, but we support you with what you really need. And <laughs> Eric, you, there's nobody better than you at this. You know exactly how that works. Yeah, it's. I, I love the whole idea. I've always been a huge fan. I've been part of, you know, some kind of group mastermind coaching for you know the entirety of my career. But it, you know, it's, this is one of those sectors that really needs it. I don't think people mm -hmm. realize how difficult it is to run a restaurant. It, I, they they don't. I I didn't realize it yeah. even with my training until I went in and my first big restaurant that I served, where I you know obviously mm -hmm. did the assessments and things like that, and I got into the nitty gritty of it. And I'm like, wow, you know, you had, you know, you saw the drug abuse. It was right mm -hmm. up front. Like there was like, th there was no hiding some of it. You know the the alcoholism, the 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 difficult pieces with the family. You know, mm -hmm. that's what I was brought in to help with. But this was a, you know, this was a very high class, you know, what we would think of as a very nice restaurant yeah. that you only go to a couple, maybe most people only would go to a time or two a year and all this dysfunction. And that was my big aha to it. And I can remember yeah. that specific restaurant uh, because of all that. And I remember the there was one gentleman, um, I can't remember which one of the cooks he was, but I mean, he just had a, like a bad spell and then actually broke into the restaurant one night while it was closed. Happens quite often. And it was just like, man, I can't believe this is really happening here. You yeah. have a guy that's very engaged, very creative. He was a great chef, right? There, there was nobody doubting his work, mm -hmm. but he just was somehow felt down on his luck. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, I, overall the industry, yeah, you know, there's a 400% turnover in the restaurant industry currently. And uh, the restaurant starting, if you start a new restaurant, there's a 60% chance you will not make it to year two. There's a 75% chance you will not make it to year three. Mm. And there's an 85% chance you will not make it beyond year three. And it's it's tough. And it, it's a tough industry because there's so much turnover mm. and you spend time just training the right people. And the challenge that for the industry is also, it's a, a serve food service overall as an entry level industry. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you can walk mm -hmm. and you know present yourself, you can get a job anywhere in a restaurant. And restaurants don't care if you have a record or not because they need help. And I think that combined with access to women, alcohol, and drugs um, is not a good a good combination. Yeah, well, so before we, we go on here and have a little fun, um, how do people check out what you're doing? Like, where can they go to check out what you're doing, <laughs> especially with the mastermind? Because I know we have some people, uh, yeah. at least that'll be listening to this um, as their restaurant so tours. Re re really good question. So if you want to be part of our mastermind, we do two open houses every other month. Actually, we did one last night. We do a new one on the 26th of this month, which is East Coast time. So that means we do it early morning. So we do an open house session. You come in, we show you what it's like. You meet some of the members. Your 80% is, is new members, which you want to interested in joining. And we show you actually how we do it. And uh, it's about an hour and a half. So you learn what the process is and what a mastermind is actually all about. And then from there, if you're interested, we ask you to do, so there's me and my partner, Lawrence. Uh, you have a me, a call with me or Lawrence or both. And we say, hey, you would be really good fit. What are three things you want to get out of it? And we always keep the three things, the three things. And for that, we say, hey, because we have groups, we don't make the groups bigger than eight to 10 people. And then we can say, oh, I'm not sure why, but we color coded them. So we said, oh, he needs to be in the orange group. Oh, no, he needs to be in the green group. <laughs> yeah, we kind of said, yeah, we'll be the best fit. Um, and then you, we just do the meetings and we ask everybody to have two hot seats a year. So a hot seat means I want to have the group's opinion on a process, a system, 
Maybe I want to have a second restaurant or I want to understand what is the difference between scaling and growing. Um, so just make yourself uh, available and, and be open to the feedback you get from the group. So we do that. And then also you could come to disruptivemastermind.com. Uh, so if you come to Business Disruptive Mastermind, uh, you could sign up, you could DM me um, or go to any of our social media sites and reach out to us. We extend the same courtesy to people reaching out to us as you did to, to us. So if you text us, we get back to you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. What's your... If you had to narrow it down to one of one thing, what's your most favorite thing about that executive mastermind? Um, I think it's the camaraderie. And during COVID, one of our members built N95, sorry, he 3D printed N95 masks for everybody in the group. And he never asked for anything in return. And there was somebody said, hey, oh, you know what? I drive to Alabama. It's only 14 hours. I meet you there. You don't need to fly. I come and pick you up. <laughs> Driving from Pennsylvania. And, and it's for me, I think it's the camaraderie. I think the, the relationships people build, um, because you can be honest in, in those settings and you can ask for help. It's hard. If you're not in the industry, coming home and talking to your spouse about what's going on in the restaurant industry. So having that um, group and they talk on each other. Uh, for me, sometimes I was like, ooh, I can't believe he just said that. Yeah. And then other people receive it. And sometimes the things what are tough to hear, the ones which move the needle. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And we actually have a program where we call it the needle move exercise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. Well, good. Um, I'm going to pose you some questions like you posed <laughs> me because I, I like, <laughs> Uh, I love that. What what do you call your question? We, we call that rapid fire question food service edition. Rap, yeah, food service edition. So I've got two for you because I, I was curious. Like I, okay, I love, sure. I absolutely love that. I actually wish we could just do the whole list, <laughs> Christian. But um, <laughs> since you know, since you're a chef, you're in the kitchen a lot. If if you were a utensil, <laughs> which one would you be and why? Uh, so that's actually an easy one for me. I will be a spatula because a spatula gets you hard to reach places and you can use it for anything when it's hot, cold. It's always there when you need it. It's always pliable. It's a good tool. It's a good thing to rely on. I will that, certainly be a spatula. That's a much better <laughs> answer than I had. Um, and the big question that I have for you before we get to the last question, which we asked all our guests on our show here, but um, I want to know, I gave you my honest answer. I don't know if it was a, a big hit or not. Pineapple on the pizza or not? <laughs> so I grew up on pineapple on the pizza. Um, now, now it belongs on dessert, not on pizza. So for me, I'm a firm no on the, on the pineapple on the pizza. And, uh, for us, when we asked this question, you could see people just, oh my God, there's no right answer for this. Um, and and listen, it's preference. For me, pineapple on the pizza is like wine, and people have preferences for it. Even if we have the same wine, we kind of perceive it differently. Yeah. And um, we had uh, actually with somebody I spoke this morning. He says, "You know what? I do pineapple pizza. Not only do a pineapple pizza, I I roast the pineapple with poblano peppers, and I do this, and then I put it on it. No, it's still pineapple on the pizza. I don't care what he dress it up. It's still pineapple on the pizza. Um, but he oh. tried to." If be creative at it. Introduce me to that guy. I love, I just, I can't get enough of it. My family <laughs> makes fun of me, Christian, for, for that too. And uh, I don't think it'll ever get old for me. That's really funny. All right. So the last question, Christian, and I'm really anticipating your answer here that we ask everybody because it's called your best day yet podcast. Yeah. How, how would you describe your best day? Ooh, that's a really good question. And for me, I did a few years ago an exercise. It's called Seven Level Deep. I don't know if you heard of it. Yes, yes. And for me, the bottom was um, I want my kids to have choices. And um, because my kids, you, you know my story, they all adopted, internationally adopted. They were banned, you know, because from some health reasons and whatever. 
my kids never had the choice of being abandoned by their parent. They haven't, they had no choice that they were dropped off in the orphanage gate. They had no choice. They were passed around from orphanage to orphanage. They had no choice that people coming, looking different, sounding different, smelling different, bring them on a plane. They had to bring him here. So for me, if you're asking me what my best is, if I can connect with all my kids in one day and see the amazing things they do and the amazing people they became, and for me, my kids are my inspiration. They struggle with some severe health issues, some of them. You will never know when you meet them. And they're amazing human beings. And for me, I, I you know, for me, it's not just the kids, my wife too, because without her, uh, this would never happen. She's really the driving force. By the way, best thing ever happened to me. She wanted to have a recipe. I said, if you want a recipe, you got to marry the chef. She said, yes. So it only worked once. Um, but yeah. um been married 30 years, most amazing human being I ever met. And for me, seeing this going on at home, my best day yet. Oh, love it. It gave me goosebumps. So <laughs> thanks for sharing. Yeah. And with that, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly uh, love talking to this gentleman and uh, we've just started a friendship. I, I can't, uh, I can't wait to see where, where it goes from here, Christian. Thanks for being a, a guest. Hopefully we can have you back, sir. Love to have you. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed it. Same here. Folks, if you want more information, you know, visit our website at centerforvictory.com. And just remember wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, Make this your best day yet. We'll I love that. Soon.